Okay, could I um, welcome on stage now the um, members of the panel session? So that's Michael Flood from John Lewis, Alistair Calder from ONS, and Mark Birkin from the University of Leeds. And Keith. Thanks very much indeed, Mike, and um, uh, we thought it was a good idea if we passed the baton to me so that I chair this session so that Mike can say uh, his two penneth or whatever and doesn't, uh, doesn't miss, uh, miss the chance. Um, I'm really pleased to uh, uh, be able to welcome the, the members of the, uh, the panel here, and uh, you know plenty about Mike already um, with his uh, M&S hat on. Uh, Alistair in particular, I think was interesting for this because of his involvement in the Beyond 2011 project at ONS, which brings together, is, is looking to bring together all sorts of large databases and uh, considering the possibilities of doing lots of sharing of data um, and the sort of thing that came up in this morning's discussion. Uh, Mark um, from the University of Leeds uh, has taken a a main role in uh, steering some of the students and uh, seem to be an ideal representative uh, um, for uh, the academic community. And uh, another retailer, Michael Flood from uh, John Lewis uh, in Head of Strategy there. So in my briefing to them, um, I said that I'm envisaging that each panellist will make some key points in, say, three minutes. I'll aim to stir the audience in getting fired up. I know one or two people get well fired up already. Where's Bob Barr? Uh, yeah, no, good old Bob Barr. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so no PowerPoint, um, but we're hope I'm hoping that each of them will just get some bullet points back to me after the day for the record. Um, and so um, if we are able to start, perhaps start with Mike, and we'll run through the panel, and then it'll be really good to hear your observations on, uh, on this topic. Thank you, Keith. So, the, the main, one of the main thrusts of the conference is about retail issues. But having thought about this, retail's actually pretty simple, isn't it? Isn't it just about giving the right product at the right time, at a price that people want to pay, and where they want to go and buy it? They're very, very simple. Now that's okay if you're a really small niche player. So go back to go back 30 years, you're a butcher in a high street, you sell meat, people come and buy that. When you start moving into scale and volume, such as the likes of M&S and the other retailers in the room, that's where the issues start to come on. You've also got the other issue of competitors in there creating noise, everybody's going for a slice of the same market. And also, as Matt said in his first presentation this morning, we've got a real changing society. Shopping is, an, is, is no longer a leisure activity. Technology is moving on, access to price comparison, access to global product offers. Shoppers are becoming much more savvy now, much more choosy, but we're also giving them more to choose from. And um, if you take all those things, then obviously the idea of big data is really good because how do we better understand what large groups of people are actually feeling and doing? So if we think about the doing bit, this is where the big data comes in. It's not really new. Lots of presentations have touched upon the fact that it's not new things. Again, it's relatively easy. It's lots of technical knowledge about databases and systems and so on. And it's about proven methods of statistical um, application. So using different stats methods to drive better value from your data. But having tried this in practice and doing this on a daily basis, there are some issues. Um, one of the things I want to really push is the um, massive skill shortage in the analytical arena and people who can take results of analysis and actually turn it into a, um, a business um, solution. So I'm going to nick some of Martin Squires' presentation from last year when he came up with the three watts, which I think are very, very applicable. I'm going to restate them. So that's the what, the so what, and the now what. So if our analysts are able to give all three things, then fantastic. They're able to take data access a problem, solve the problem, and actually tell the business what to do about that problem. But we're facing this with a real information surge, and it's about picking out what data is relevant. 
So I've covered the doing bit to know what the customers are feeling. We tend to find that from research. We've got traditional methods of data capture, whether that's questionnaires, interviews, accompanied shops, intercepts, and so on. But actually, there's loads of information out there about what customers are feeling on the internet. So you've got the likes of Twitter, different forums, <laughs> Facebook, blogs, etc. So really, that's where research and big data collide. So can we use big data technology to pull out simple sentiment from what people are actually um, putting out there on the internet? But how do you ensure that these are real, true customer views? You haven't just got a group of people who are just saying bad things about your company because they want to. So that was a bit of a three minute ramble, so I got the three minute bit right. So in, in summary, I say that all industries will always be faced with different issues of the day. They're different issues, but they'll still be faced with issues. Technology, as we've seen, can play a real part in answering these questions, but the real value is really about what you do with what you found out. Thank you. Thanks so much, indeed, Mike. We'll go straight on to Alistair. Thanks. Um, I love this event every year because it tells me stuff I don't know and it makes me think about things I don't think about very often, which is really good. So compliments to Keith and Mike and ESRC for another great event, I think. Um, I have, however, been thinking a lot about big data for what seems like years, but a lot in the last year, because we're working at the moment on the project that was mentioned there beyond 2011. So that's looking at options for going forward from the census and what we do next. Um, Clive had a big red cross against the next census. It's not quite as brutal as that because we're looking at a whole range of options um, and new innovative ways of doing a census are included in amongst those options. But a lot of our focus is on big data, looking at the administrative sources we might build upon to know more about the population and looking for solutions in amongst that data. So this would be very interesting today. Um, so we're trying to answer basically the key questions, and they are, can we lever the population numbers out of these data, out of the administrative data? That's the public data, but also commercial data that are available. Um, and I think the answer is yes, we can, actually. I think we can do that. Some of the sources are challenging, the linking's not trivial, but we can do this. Um, can we do it consistently for small areas across the nation, which is what the census does? I think we can do that as well. Again, it's not easy. There's issues around quality and what different users need in terms of quality, but we can do that as well. Everything wrapped up in about seven layers of anonymity and confidentiality. We can do it, though. Can we do every variable in the census from existing data sources? And I think the answer to that is just as clear. And the answer is no, we can. It's not possible to do that. Um, and that's why we've been consulting very widely on what data really matters to people. We ran a consultation um, start of this year. Um, trying to focus in on what really matters to people. We are very likely to have to, whatever happens, we're likely to have to run big surveys. But this rethink of what we're doing gives us opportunities to, do, to produce other data sets, other variables than the ones that have been run in the census before. So it's a huge opportunity for us. The other big question is, is it the right thing to move away from a census to doing something based upon the numbers? And that's not quite so clear. How do the public feel about us making that kind of change? Um, and we're going to be consulting early next year on all this. Um, but when we talk to the public just now, we've run some focus groups, and they are essentially feel that government should share data. I mean, I'm oversimplifying the view, but a lot of people think that government already does share data. They're less comfortable with sharing commercial and the commercial people in that relationship. And I didn't know quite how I was going to broach that, but Clive threw me a brilliant quote earlier on when he said, um, customers don't trust retailers. Um, so sorry about that, but that's some of the feedback that we have. Equally, when we talk to commercial data suppliers, there is a weariness from some people about sharing data. And that's because knowledge is power and the data that's at the bottom of that knowledge triangle is, is commercial advantage for a lot of people, particularly at the moment when you're dealing with loyalty relationships that are multiple relationships and margins are so tight, it's not easy this, but we would very much like to find ways of getting some of this data, getting access to some of this data, and we're, we'll talk to anybody about that, we're very interested, but as we see it, the data sharing thing should be a two-way street, we'd love to engage more with you on some of this stuff. Where we're at just now, we're looking at all the options. Um, we don't know quite how things are going to play out, but personally, I would say it's all but inevitable that some of the data that's out there, some of the questions that have already been asked of people, must be played into the, 
support. We must be building upon some of the existing data sets. It's, it's kind of got to be. I think there's a kind of efficiency imperative and a kind of a professional response, I mean, even a moral responsibility to make as much use of the data that's already out there and all the questions we've already asked people and would welcome discussion about that or discussion with particularly on this topic to do with how we build commercial partnerships and relationships on commercial data. Thanks, Alistair. A mention of the two-way street there, which I think is uh, very appropriate. Mark. Uh, okay, thanks, Keith. Um, so I'm also struck by this idea that um, uh, big data and, uh, and the associated things have, have, been, have been with us for a while. Uh, so when I was preparing what I wanted to say, I, I started thinking back. And I want to say 20 years, but I, I actually know that the idea I want to talk about originated in a paper that uh, I wrote with some colleagues in 1986. Um, and it was to do with the advent of uh, geographic information systems in, in geography. Uh, and we had a slide that, that we devised that I used a lot with, um, with students and also in, in talking to retailers and other outside organisations. Um, and Keith wouldn't let me put it up on the screen. Maybe, maybe it's as well. I'll describe it to you. So this slide has got a, a big pile of something not very nice in the middle of it. Uh, and it's got four words. So some of you may have seen it or something similar. And it says, data diarrhoea and information constipation. And so, for example, we're trying to get across the idea uh, at the time, so people were starting to use GIS, so a retailer, for example, could plot out you know, where their customers were and to count how many of them were within five miles or ten minutes or whatever of a store. But uh, I guess the, the so what question from Michael, you know, is that really... You, we need to try and find the meaning in some of this, uh, this information. Um, so with the... Um, and again, I apologise for any sensitivities that may arise, but um, <laughs> you know, so I'm starting to be concerned now about the idea of big data diarrhoea. Um, and I think it's really important that we focus on the idea of, of how can we, and this is, this is a bit cliched in some computer science circles, but you know, how do we get the information, the intelligence, the knowledge out of these big new data sets? Uh, well, I think that the, um, from my perspective, the answer to that is pretty much, you know, how, will we, how, how did we need to do that 25 years ago? You know, and we argue that a, lot, a large part of that was about spatial analysis, about simulation. Now, I lead a centre for um, spatial data analysis and simulation, so I'm going to say that, aren't I? Um, but let me just give you uh, one example, quite quickly, of some of the work that we're trying to do that maybe gets this across. Um, and the example relates to, to Twitter, which uh, one or two people have talked about earlier on. Um, now, I'm not a, 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 a tweeter or a Twitterer, um, but I'm developing a very sad interest in, in, in people that are. Um, and I've been developing an extremely sad interest just over the last couple of days in the topic of pizza. Uh, I've got some quotes. Um, we've got a data set. I've got a data set on the, on the laptop in front of me of about 220,000 geolocated tweets in Leeds um, from about a six, seven-week period last, last summer. And so, for example, some of the things that people say about pizza. So the first one here I've got, it says, pizza, 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 Leeds, Leeds, Leeds. <laughs> I, it baffles me why anybody would waste the time, the energy, the money... <laughs> Tweeting that, you really that was you. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. But, um, so, yeah, which is a good example, actually, of, you know, yes, data, but, you know, is it, is it, is it really of any, any value to us? But then we started going on to more interesting things. So, for example, I've got, I'm at Pizza Hut, and as I say, these are all geolocated, so we know where that is. Um, I'm at Pizza Hut with Scott and Leon, you know, the social networks thing, starting to get quite interesting. I've got another one here, it says, Pizza and the Simpsons, life is exciting. Uh, probably not at Pizza Hut. I, I think that person's yeah, at home with the TV. I just became the mayor of Pizza Top on at Four Square. And this is another life that is, is beyond me, but I'm not, uh, that relates to some kind of uh, video game, I assume. Uh, can't believe I actually spent £50 in Asda. I only went for a pizza, okay? So some kind of shopping activity. So my point is that potentially we've got quite a lot of intelligence in here about you know, where people are, what are they doing, how are they moving around, how are they interacting? You know, this is really actually um, a gold dust for geographers. Potentially, we've never, you know, we've never quite had this before. Now, final point here is you might say, well, okay, you know, that's just for a bunch of these, um, sorry, can I say this? Yes, you know, slightly strange uh, individuals, um, you know, and it's not very representative and, and, and so on and so forth. And again, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd be with you there. So, so again, that's where I come back, you know, to ideas of simulation. Now, I believe it's possible to take some of this information and then, the, again, this very important idea of starting to integrate with other kinds of data sets, you know, maybe from the census, the post-census, maybe from individual sets of customer records, telephone companies, understanding society, whatever, 
and that we can actually start to put together simulations that are fully representative of the whole population of which this is some kind of slightly skewed sample, but providing us really important um, you know, ele elements of this, of this picture. Um, so just finally, I mean, I mean this, kind of, um, you know, this kind of work we, we know already is really interesting to people like health and emergency services, and um, Dave Martin is also in the room could talk to you about that, because he's been having some of those conversations with people. You know, bomb, uh, there's a bomb scare in the centre of London. It's very interesting to know where people live. It's even more interesting to know, you know where they actually are, you know, what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. So those kinds of things. I think this sort of thing could be really interesting for retailers. You know, yes, these days you might know a lot about your customers, what products they're buying, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, you know, do you know where they were before they came to buy those products? You know, have they come from uh, school? Have they come from work? Have they come from a football match? What have you, this kind of thing. Um, you know, do you know which competitor outlets they've, they've been in, what else they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think that's, you know, I think there are a lot of potentially quite interesting questions here. Um, in terms of next steps, uh, I'm around for a bit, but you, again, you can find us uh, on the internet. Uh, check out Research Project, do get in touch. Great stuff, great stuff. Michael. Well, Keith, I thought I'd spend the two or three minutes talking about what the subjects that are really keeping retailers up at night in a sort of generic sense. And the most important issue for retailers at the moment, as, as I see it, is the threat to future profitability. Um, if you go right back to this morning's presentation from Matt Piner, um, he talked about the consumer, talked about the consumer being the winner, they can buy goods when, where they like, they can have it delivered to them anywhere. Um, this degree of unprecedented choice driven by technology um, is, is fantastic for the consumer. Admittedly, they haven't had as much money to spend in recent years as, as they want. Um, but from the retailer's perspective, um, we're beginning to behave like retailers did before the self-service supermarket revolution, e.g. we are <coughs> taking on the distribution costs of goods direct to the consumer again. So instead of a delivery boy um, on a bicycle delivering your products that you've selected in the shop, you're getting it delivered by various, various uh, delivery methods or you're clicking and collecting. At the end of the day, that's just adding costs on to retailers. The other issue is around shops and shopping. The, um, the bar has been significantly raised in terms of customers' expectation of a great retail experience um, in recent years, principally by two Westfields, one in West London, one in East London, which have hoovered up a billion pounds of non-food spend almost from, from nothing, but present a... Uh, an experience to the consumer that, that's un unprecedented in terms of retail, food, and leisure. Now, both these two effects demand investment from retailers technolog in technological infrastructure and in shops, and that demands capital. At the same time, our marketing spend has got to be super efficient and effective across multiple channels, generally within the same proportion of, of sales. So whilst the consumer um, has tremendous advantage, the retailer's question now is how can I maintain and grow profits in this scenario, particularly facing into a flat market up to 2020? So the challenge is around operating two distinct models now. One is a model for shops that's got very high fixed costs and property costs and one is an online model which has got very high variable costs. Now the issue is that we don't know for sure what proportion of sales are going to be online in the future. Um, if I reflect back on um, various presentations that, I, that I've seen or reports that I've read in the past few years, five years ago, online sales were thought to be seven, eight percent of total retail sales. Go back two or three years, and I was hearing 14%. This morning, I'm hearing 20%. I think for retailers, we've got to plan for a world where online participation might be significantly higher than that 20%. So going back to my online model with high variable costs, the bigger the proportion of sales going online, more costs we're going to incur, and the greater the squeeze on profits. So what do we need to do about it? We need to work out um, the most effective um, profitability model by category, by channel, and by fulfillment method. Um, 
We don't know the answers to that at the moment, but these are some of the questions that data and research has got to help us address over the next two to three years. So if you're an academic thinking about how you can help the retail sector, I would strongly urge you to focus on, on some of these issues. Um, I say, Those don't know the answers, <laughs> but know what some of the pain is looking like. Right. That's really good. Thanks ever so much. Now I'd like to throw it open and uh, pleased to hear your observations, questions, points, disputes or whatever. Um, do put up your hand and then uh, say who you are and where you're from. <laughs> good, good man, Bob, and you can rely on you. I'm really in the wrong meeting because uh, the question I want to ask is about a very small data set. It's only got 28 million records, only about 100,000 of them change uh, every month, uh, and it's been uh, pretty constant in its uh, format for the last 20 years or so. Uh, it is uh, my obsession as well as an obsession of quite a few Doug users. Uh, in fact, I, I fear it's not an obsession for many Doug users because apparently 37,000 organisations do licence PAF. Uh, and I suspect that uh, many of the commercial users of Doug probably do not find PAF licensing terms particularly onerous. However, the PAF Advisory Board launched uh, a consultation very quietly by putting it up on their website. Uh, about four days ago, which closes on the 31st of uh, October. And they're asking people to say, do they want to pay a lot for PAF or would they ra rather pay a bit more than that for PAF uh, under the new licensing terms? What they do not uh, provide is an option for an open version of PAF. Now, given that addressing is absolutely critical to understanding big data, and at the moment, uh, access to address files for handling uh, the location element in big data are really quite severely restricted because of licensing terms, uh, I'd like to know from the panel uh, whether they think that making PATH open is an appropriate way forward and what they think the best way to do that is in addition to writing the PATH advisory board. Thank you very much indeed there, Bob. Um, who might like to rise to the subject? Because I, I suppose underlying all that we've been talking about have been addresses and matching data sets and so on. And in fact, I'm particularly looking at Alistair here because this is the man who uh, was responsible for uh, creating the address file for the 2011 census. So, yes, what thoughts have you got about Not this? Not on my own. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know if I can comment from ONS's point of view, but I think it's self-evident that, yeah, there are certain parts of infrastructure that should be as freely available as possible, and the whole country runs around them. Personally, I would support any freedom that can, uh, that can come around the path. See much more than that. Yeah, well, um, I mean, I'll make a comment, which is a slightly uninformed one, but I was at a meeting yesterday uh, at which the topic of crowdsourcing was quite prominent. I know one or two people mentioned that earlier on. I don't fully understand why, I mean, why can't you just kind of crowdsource it from the bottom up? I mean, you, you know, you set up a website somewhere, I'm quite happy to volunteer my address and postcode and stick a pin on a, you know, an open street map or something for you. I mean, I appreciate there are sort of the boundaries that you might want to, you know, stick around, around that to make it, make it fully useful. But, I, I, you know, why don't you start the process of actually um, open sourcing it from the bottom up would be my yeah. suggestion. Yeah. Um, Can I just just add something. Sorry, is that completely think, legal? No, it's, a, it's as legal as you like. Um, I think the issue is that the just the times comes a time when there has to be a definitive version of something as part of the infrastructure, and there's lots of different ways in which you could regenerate this data, but we're that close to having national definitive sources, and it just needs sorted out, in my opinion. And I don't think rebuilding anything from scratch is actually the right thing to do in this case. But I think some, some wider access to these definitive sources is absolutely fundamental to what we're doing. The, the only thing I would add is, is to pick up Bob asking whether, as a commercial company, we would just pay more for it. Um, I think it depends on how much more, and I think there's a, there's a piece of elastic that would stretch the point where we say we would pay it because it has value for us, and then if it became so expensive, we'd look at alternative ways of getting that data. And I think the crowdsourcing one is of personal interest to me, and I think is a really good way of, of collecting information. I think there's one other element uh, lurking here, but it's not just price, is it? Because um, I know one of the Doug members has been looking at this, and the, the complexity of the contract of how much should I be paying and not being able to talk to somebody at Royal Mail, you know, a salesperson who would say, well, this is what you need to pay, 
and that is a great barrier and a pickle as well. So it's not just a matter of having a rate card and can I, can I not afford it? Um, I'm just wondering whether there's anybody in government here who might uh, have got some views or might be able to help. Is Jill still lurking at the back there? Uh... I agree absolutely with Alistair. <laughs> 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 but I think particularly on presumably merging of you know, major departmental files, um, you know, the whole data sharing of, I don't know, DWP, HMRC and so on, uh, how it would help if there was a common address file, wouldn't it? Any, any further thought, Bob, or...? Uh, uh... No, better than do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I think that every so often, every ten years or so, we hit a critical moment as far as addressing was concerned. Uh, one critical moment was Crown Copyright Review, when ONS, who had been, uh, I was, was going to say rather rudely, pitifully trying to recover their costs, and managed at one stage to recover 15% of their operational costs, I think, and dear Tricia Hewitt said, God bless your cotton socks, there's no point in holding census data back from government departments in order to recover 15% of your costs, just give the data away. But unfortunately, what happened in the Crown Copyright Review was that a great Berlin Wall was built between national data infrastructure that went on the free side of the wall, where statistics went, and national data infrastructure which went on the cost recovery side of the wall, which is where Ordnance Survey and Royal Mail ended up. And the real problem is that the tradable information, the reason I raised the issue of license costs, I think the license costs are really critical. The government, uh, the act that controls Royal Mail says that the postcode address file must be made available at a reasonable price. In 1986, it cost Royal Mail £3 million a year to maintain the postcode address file. They're now spending £30 million a year for what is effectively the same file. Uh, they maintain it at 100,000 records a month. It's not a big data set by any stretch of the imagination. Ordnance Survey, in the same time, have only doubled their turnover from 80 million to about 130 million. They now look after 500 million spatial objects and update them every six months if they've changed. They produce a massive range of digital products, a massive range of paper products, so they've been incredibly cost effective. So, by any stretch of the imagination, Royal Mail have not managed the address system cost effectively, and now they're looking for ways of extending uh, 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 pay-per-click uh, right down to the individual consumer level. They're worried that collecting license fees from just 37,000 licensees is not sufficiently uh, worthwhile. Right, and the we only will continue the crusade, Bob. It's, uh... <laughs> Can I just finish one final point, because I think it is important. Royal Mail are just spending at the moment, I estimate, between 35 and 50 million pounds re-geocoding every point in the postcode address file. They're going to give you the map coordinates within five meters of your letterbox and your gate, as opposed to the map coordinates of your property. Now, they're using development funds, which are taxpayer funds, because they're 100% taxpayer owned. Everybody, shareholder executive, Royal Mail, say that's perfectly all right. They're allowed to do that as a commercial venture. The only purpose of that is to undermine Geoplace, the Ordnance Survey local government company that's already providing, albeit at too high a price, geocodes for every property. So right. Address War 3 has broken out. People need to be aware of it. And the way to respond is respond to the PAF Advisory Board consultation right. on licenses. Thank you Very for the time. Good. Yeah, well said, well said. Yeah, thank you for that. Right, further observations, um, perhaps from some of the retailers on points that uh, Mike and Michael made. Any uh, agreement with this sort of thing or uh, disagreement? Can, I, can yeah. I ask a question? Does anybody want to give us their data? <laughs> and if not, why not? How much? <laughs> how much? <laughs> like, how much, how much data, how much will we pay you for it? How much will you pay for it? Oh, is it? Okay, so that's an, is that the issue? That's all the issue, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is David Reinstein. I'm from the Economics Department at the University of Essex. And uh, I, I don't have any data to give you right now, and I'm not a retailer, sorry. But I, this question is, I'm not good with names too. Uh, I, think it was, I think it was Mike, formerly David, who mentioned that, uh, I'm sorry, the shortage of 
uh, people who can analyze the data, I'm paraphrasing, and tell us, so who can analyze the data, who have the skills to analyze the data, and tell us what the so what is, what to do with it. And um, there was also a mention that the, the key issue for retailers is to work out in, in the face of all these competitive threats, what the most profitable, I forget it, I'm trying to paraphrase, but the most profitable uh, marketing strategy, I believe it was, by channel category and fulfillment channel. Now, and I think that was in, in advice to academics to an extent, or researchers working with the data as to what the, um, what the most useful step to take. Now, I just think um, there's a bit of a difficulty there because you can always find someone, I mean, if you, if you hire an, an actor, they can come in and tell you with a lot of confidence exactly what the most successful you know, solution to your problem will be. Uh, and they can tell you that, uh, that there's, there's very little doubt in their minds and they're the you know, most former F, F, expert in the field. And, and maybe there's some consultants that would do that too. But I, I think if you're looking for um, academics to work with the data, I mean, th there's a lot of challenge, there's gonna be a lot of challenges. I mean, and they're going to say, I mean, I think a problem is using, using terminology that's difficult to, to parse, but I think typically they'll say, okay, if we assume this, we can, we can say that this is true with it, this is, within a certain parameter range, or this will be true, or this will be the way to go with fairly high confidence. Um, but I think one of the challenges, for instance, even if the, the data is, is made available richly, there's still an, often an issue of even if I know everything that's going on in a snapshot, I still can't tell you what the effect making a change will be because, I mean, the, the policies were generated uh, you, you made these decisions in the past and the, and the state of the world is the way it is because of a complex interaction of factors. So I guess, I guess it's more of a comment than a, than a question, but I guess uh, what do you think the best way for academics would be to present themselves and, and, um, and uh, be, be of help uh, recognizing the fact that, that they, they, you know, they're typically not by nature going to give you a, a definite, they're, they're going to express their conclusions with sort of yeah, statistical yeah, uncertainty. Mike, can I just... Yeah, I think that? The, the point I was trying to make is that there seems to be a shortage of people coming into industry from um, completing university courses <laughs> who are data curious, I suppose, and are willing to and wanting to roll their sleeves up look at data and actually pick out issues and then try and resolve those issues, but in a practical, pragmatic, commercial um, sense, rather than being purist and wanting to only apply certain statistical models because they're the right ones to apply. Looking for people who can think on their feet and almost misuse, misuse different stats models to actually come up with something that is innovative and will move um, MS on as a business. At the end of the day, we're a commercial business, we're there to make money. And the point I was making is having um, been involved quite heavily in recruitment, there are so few people coming into the marketplace with those skills. Michael, any further? Well, just to build on that, I think it's the ability to triangulate across different data sets quickly to come up with a practical answer to a business problem that might not be 100% of the answer, but it's good enough to get us get right. us to a point where we can make a decision. That's what we really want from that engagement. And Mark, you've seen it from the other side over 20 plus years, haven't you? What are uh, well, I have. I mean, I, I, I'll just make a couple of observations from yeah. the, from, again, from the academic point yeah. of view. I mean, I, I just, you know, I think it is important to, you know, for us to all, all do what we're good at in this, uh, you know, in, in, this, in this relationship, as it were. I mean, I think, you know, if we're talking about there being a lack of, you know, trained people to do analysis, I mean, I'm particularly interested in this kind of triangulation and data linkage and what have you. And that is an issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be fair, if the, I don't know if the ESRC representative is still here, but you know, I mean, the ESRC uh, are, tr are trying to address this. You know, through mm -hmm. the secondary data analysis initiative, 
through the National Centre for Research Methods. I mean, I think we all re recognise that there's a there's a way to go, but you, you know, there's some recognition of the problem, and clearly through the things we've heard about, you know, bringing yeah. the retail and, and the academia yeah. together, you know, we, we we're trying to encourage the the debate. And I think we can, you know, we can also think about you know kind of research mm. challenges that are kind of interesting and strategic. But you, you know, you're not going to get academics to you know find the most profitable stores in a network. You know, you know, I mean, you use consultants for that, don't you, uh, Keith? Or or you build up your internal expertise, you know, using using these better analysts that we might ultimately be able to, you know, to, to help to generate yeah. or to, to provide you with. I think. Yeah. Right. One more question. Uh, I think we've got time for yes, please. Hi, Alex Peel, Sainsbury's. Um, I've been very interested by. Firstly, the discussion around trying to, you know, we have all this data, how can you best understand it and how you can get value out of that and value in terms of monetizing that information and also um, being able to use that information to inform business decisions. Um, and I think that the point that Alistair raised briefly about around sort of how you monetize that data and what's the value of that data is very interesting. Um, Watching the Facebook IPO and watching the difficulty that that company's had in trying to <coughs> realise the value of their information and monetise that information, I'd be interested to hear anyone's views on how you can, first, how you can get value out of that information, which companies you feel are doing it well, and what are the secrets. So be that using it to inform business decisions or be it selling data sets um, in usable formats that people are then able to analyse bearing in mind the sometimes limited ability of analysts to take on enormous complicated data sets. Right. I've got a couple of thoughts on that. Perhaps if I uh, mm -hmm. just uh, start off and then anybody else chime in. But I think um, one uh, great example this morning was Clive Humby and the, you know, the way that um, Don Humby turned Tesco Club Card on its head to sell data back to the FMCG companies. And I think that was an interesting one. Um, also, I think that these things needn't always be in financial terms because there was one of the, uh, the Doug members who was involved in uh, discussions about uh, their customer data and what potential there was for using it for ONS and beyond 2011 and you know, substitute for the census. And they said that it needn't necessarily be a financial transaction because they um, were concerned about corporate reputation and they wanted to be seen to be on the side of the angels. And so there might be a bigger thing that, you know, the company's helping in this way and it's not a direct payment, but there may be other things that seem to be helpful. Just a thought. I don't know if any, any other thoughts from the panel on, the, on that. Yes, yeah, I'll have a go again. I mean, um, uh, I mean, I think, you know, when, when, you, when you ask the question about monetizing the value of data, I mean, I think one of the things we're talking about here is, you know, using data to make decisions or to make better decisions. And again, I mean, I just think that's something that's, you know, that is really hard often to quantify the value of. I mean, if you take something like, I don't know, uh, response modeling, you know, direct marketing or something, then you might say, okay, if I can increase your response rate by, you know, 10%, X% percent, whatever, then maybe you've got mm -hmm. ways that you could put a value on that. But, I mean, an example from my own... Uh, experience, but we did some work with a, a household name DIY retailer quite a few years ago now, and um, you know we demonstrated that we that we could actually predict their store performance with really quite surprising, even for me, um, accuracy, and certainly a lot more effectively than they could do it in house. But and you say, okay, well, what does that allow you to do? You know, it allows you to make better investment decisions. They believe that they, it allowed to make more decisions because they could have more confidence in the stores they're opening, what have you. And the value of that is probably quite large, but I mean, how, how you actually monetize that value is, is, is really quite a difficult challenge, I think. So in writing about it, we found that mm. difficult. So if you, if you can't actually quantify the value of the decisions that you're making, you know, then I think, I think it's hard if you go back to say, well, you know, what is the value in, in having the, the better data and the analysis and, and the methodologies and all this, all, right. all this stuff? Right. I'm aware of time marching on, and the, cha the proper chairman might uh, call me to order fairly shortly. Um, so I think uh, it's now time to move on to the um, uh, Doug Award for Better Information.